Let's get started by first defining what it means to scale. At a high level, scaling is the process of providing more resources to your application or database with the intent to improve its performance. Also, as a general rule of thumb, scaling computation is always easier than scaling data. For example, let's say that you have a website that serves customer traffic, say Amazon.com. If you need to scale your front end, you can just provision hundreds of servers on the fly, put them behind the load balancer, and scale your website. Doing the same for your database tends to be harder. In this talk, we're going to talk about the latter, which is the scaling the database part. And when you're scaling your database, you need to think about both hardware and software resources. Usually though, if you can linearly scale your hardware, you're in a good place to scale your database. We're therefore going to focus on the hardware dimension of scaling. So the simplest way to scale is known as vertical scaling. In this approach, you simply go and buy a bigger machine. In this example here, we have a PostgreSQL machine that has four virtual CPUs, 30 gigs of RAM, 80 gigs of SSD, and uh, we basically go and buy a bigger machine, migrate our database to another machine that has four times the hardware resources across all the dimensions, and then we scale up. This approach is the simplest way to scale your hardware resources, and we recommend that you always leverage it first. That said, what is a possible drawback associated with this approach? Any guesses? Cost is one. Uh, what else? Yes, and then at some point you're going to run into a wall. So if your application keeps growing, with the previous one, you may need to, like, you hit a wall, a certain wall, and in that case, you will need to scale out your database into many different machines. When you follow this approach, you can continue to scale your CPU, memory, and storage resources by adding new machines into your cluster. This approach is also known as horizontal scaling, and we're going to focus on this in the rest of our talk. Now, an important question to answer is, when is the right time to think about horizontal scaling? The answer to that question primarily depends on where in your application and database's life cycle you are. If you're at a stage where you can throw more hardware at the problem, we recommend that you always do that first. We also recommend spending time in tuning your database's config settings and optimizing your queries. In other words, if you don't need to scale out, don't scale out. With that said, if your SaaS application is growing, there will be a point where you're going to start running into performance issues. So when is the right time to start thinking about scaling out? We've seen numerous customers, hundreds actually, who look to scale out their Postgres databases at Citus. In terms of when to scale, I compiled three heuristics that I wanted to share. These aren't hard written rules, it's best to think of them as general guidelines. The first one is, if your business is growing and you're on the second largest instance type available on your cl cloud provider, you probably want to start thinking about scaling out. Why the second largest instance type and not the largest one? Because your business will continue to grow on and being on the second largest instance type will give you breathing room to grow while you start thinking about scaling and potentially sharding. A second heuristic that usually applies for OLTP type workloads is auto vacuum. This is Postgres specific. Postgres uses auto vacuum daemons to clean up load caused by MVCC. And the default vacuum settings are too conservative to begin with. If you haven't tuned your auto vacuum settings, you should first look into making them more aggressive. If you have, and you're still experiencing performance related uh, issues due to vacuum, then it may be a good time to start thinking about scaling out. A third heuristic relates to how much of your working set your database can serve from memory. Most databases will track how often you hit the cache and when you need to issue disk I.O. For LTP applications, most of your working set should be served from the cache. Ideally, you'd want to serve 99% of your lookup queries from the cache itself. Now in Postgres, a good way to calculate your cache hit ratio is by running these two queries. 
The query at the top calculates your cash hit ratios for the tables, and the query below calculates the cash hit ratios for the indexes. And if that's starting to draw below like 99%, then it may be a good time to start thinking about horizontally scaling. To recap, you have several heuristics you can keep an eye out for. By using those heuristics, you can have a sense of the right time to scale. Then, when that time, time, time comes, what do you do? What are different approaches to scaling out? We find that the answer to that question depends on your requirements, and that the following two questions help better identify those requirements. First, are you looking to scale out a database that serves B2B, B2B2C, or B2C applications? And then this talk is about scaling B2B workloads. Second, do you have a transactional or an analytical workload? This question is orthogonal to the first one. You can have a B2B or a B2C application, and you can be interested in serving transactional or analytical workload on either of these. The B2B workload that we're focusing on in this talk lends itself to what's known as a multi-tenant database. If you're building a B2B application, most information relates to tenants, customers, accounts, and your database tables capture this natural relationship. As an example, you could be building a marketing automation tool for other businesses. In this case, each business that you serve, along with their data, becomes a tenant in your database. And the notion of a multi-tenant database isn't new. It's been around for at least two decades. What's new, and primarily in the context of scaling multi-tenant databases, is the web and the cloud. We now have cost-effective SaaS applications. These applications no longer only serve dozens of Fortune 1000 companies, but they also empower thousands of others like businesses. And these SaaS applications more and more rely on open source, and they need ways to scale to tens of thousands of tenants. Further, SaaS applications can store even more information to help their customers, thanks to sharp drops in hardware prices. These reasons combined create a distinct motivation to scale multi-tenant databases. Google's F1 paper is a good example that demonstrates a multi-tenant database that scales this way. The paper talks about technical challenges associated with scaling out the Google AdWords platform to over 1 million tenants. And in this case, every Google AdWords customer is a tenant in the Google AdWords database. The paper also describes common RDBMS properties F1 leverages for powering the underlying AdWords platform. Those features are transactions, joins across tables to avoid data duplication, and database constraints to make sure that each tenant's data remains consistent. The F1 paper also highlights how best to model data to support many tenant customers in a distributed database. I'm not sure how visible it is from the back, but the data model on the left-hand side talks about the relational database model. In this model, you have customer, campaign, and ad group tables, three tables, modeled according to the relational model, and each one of them are actually distributed on their primary key. So the customer table is partition, uh, distributed on the customer ID, campaign on the campaign ID, and the ad group on the ad group ID. Now the challenge here is, if you're running transactions across these entities, or if you're joining these data sets together, all operations you're performing are actually going over the network. And now you need to do these operations in a consistent manner. The model on the right-hand side, which is called the hierarchical database model, follows a different approach. Again, you have the same three tables, your customer, your campaign, your ad group tables. In this case, however, you start by distributing the customer table, which is at the top of the hierarchy, on the customer ID column. The next one is the campaigns. Customers have their campaigns. These are the campaigns you're running in AdWords. So you distribute that table on two keys, or actually on the primary key in here on the customer ID. And now you have another table, which is the ad group, and then that starts with the customer ID again. So you're basically enforcing this hierarchy, and by doing this, you're making sure that these three tables actually are collocated together. When they're collocated together, operations such as transactions 
which are primarily on the customer ID dimension, or joins, or you may have foreign key constraints, are co-located all to the same machine. And then the one obviously on the right hand side is the model used by Google's F1. The key benefit to the hierarchical database model is that it enforces this data co-location. In its simplest form, you add a customer ID, tenant ID column to your tables and shard them on customer ID. This ensures that data from the same customer gets co-located together and co-location dramatically reduces the cost associated with distributed transactions, joins, and foreign key constraints. Co-location also simplifies costs associated with handling network and machine failures. In summary, the hierarchical database model brings performance as a key benefit. Any questions on the previous model? Does this generally make sense? Cool. So I'm looking at the concept of co-location a bit deeper. Again, in this diagram, we have three tables. And then this is my pointer in here. And then all the three tables are actually distributed on the store ID. So store ID is here, store ID is here, store ID is here on the three tables. And then this way, when you run a transaction or a join that, are, that is scoped to a particular store, you can always push it down without having to pay the cost of managing these operations over the network. Similarly, you can create your foreign key constraints across these tables and not manage the network penalty. Collocating these tables sounds great, but what happens if I have a table that doesn't fit into this model? For example, this could happen if you have a web application that serves different organizations. Each organization normally has its own users. However, you may want to simplify the login process for those users who log into multiple organizations. You could handle this user's login table in one of two ways. You could either keep it as a regular Postgres table or you could shard your user's login table on the user ID column and make sure that you don't join it with the other tables. So that's one, like a large table that is actually somewhat independent of the hierarchy, that's outside of the hierarchy. A second common type is small tables that touch across all tenant related tables. Say, think of time zones, regions, those type of tables. For these tables, you can either denormalize them into the larger tables or you can create reference tables that are replicated across all the nodes. Now, we talked about scaling multi-tenant databases. Let's look at different ways to implement this approach. If you'd like to scale your multi-tenant database with the idea, like the previous idea in mind, how do you go about it? At a high level, you have three options. You can create a separate database for each tenant. You can create a separate schema or namespace uh, for each tenant. Or you can have all tenants share the same tables within a database. Each one of these design options comes with different benefits. And I'll look to describe them in the next few slides. In the first approach, you create a separate database for each tenant. From a hardware standpoint, these databases could all be living on the same physical machine, or they could be on separate machines, where each database has its own fair share of resources. And then, in here we have, for example, one database for tenant 5, another for tenant 1251, uh, and a third one for tenant 1252. And each database only holds a particular tenant's data. So if you have a query that is for tenant five, you route that query to this particular database. This approach, creating a separate database for each tenant, optimizes for isolation of tenants. You may need to use this model in industries such as healthcare or finance that have regulatory requirements. This model also has the benefit that you could give each tenant SQL access to the underlying database and have each tenant run their own queries. The trade-off is DBAs now need to manage different databases and make sure that each database gets allocated its fair share of hardware resources. In practice, customers who have isolation of tenants as their primary decision criteria go with this approach. <laughs> 
In the second design pattern, you create a separate namespace for each tenant within the same database. From a hardware standpoint, these schemas could again all live on the same machine, or you could add logic to place them on different machines. In this diagram, for example, tenant 5 and all the tables associated with tenant 5 are allocated their own namespace within this database. When a query comes in, you set this setting in PostgreSQL search path to tenant 5, and now you send the query and it gets answered from this namespace schema itself. When you think of isolation and resource sharing as trade-offs, like one trade-off is basically you're isolating and then the other one is you're sharing all the resources in the most efficient way, this approach sits between option one and option three. It's the one in the middle. In this model, you can continue to isolate a tenant's data and queries into a particular database schema. And the model may or may not address the regulation requirements depending on your industry. Similarly, compared to the one database per tenant model, this approach does a more efficient job at sharing resources. You now have one database that manages all resources allocated to it. At the same time, you may start observing other resource challenges. For example, if each one of your tenants has 100 tables and you have 1,000 tenants, your database needs to maintain 100,000 tables. ORM tools cache metadata related to all tables in the database when you start up, so each ORM process then caches data related to 100,000 tables. The third design pattern is the one where all tenants share the same database tables in a particular database. So it's all shared, and you basically add columns into your tables to represent the tenant that particular row is associated with. In this Diagram, for example, we have three tables, tenants, campaigns, and leads. And then in the leads table, for example, each lead has a tenant associated with them. And then you keep all leads for all tenants within one table. You can then ensure that these tables are consistent through database constraints. In this approach, you don't have the strict isolation guarantees as the one database per tenant approach. For example, your application needs to add a tenant ID filter to the queries going into the database. On the scaling side, this design pattern easily scales to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of tenants, since all tenant data lives as rows in regular database tables. This approach also simplifies the operational burden. For example, you can add columns to your table schema and the database takes care of all that work, like when you do an alter table add column across all the tenants for you. So how do you pick between these three design patterns? The truth is, each one of the three design options with enough effort can address questions around scale and isolation. The decision depends on the primary dimension you're building optimizing for. A simplified rule of thumb is, if you're building for scale, have all tenants share the same tables. If you're building for isolation, create a separate database for each tenant. Now, a natural follow-up question is, why having all tenants share the same tables provides better scaling characteristics? The answer to that question comes from our definition of scaling. Scaling is allocating more hardware and software resources to your database. The more efficiently those resources are shared, the better your scaling characteristics get. As an example, if you create a separate database for each tenant, then you need to separately allocate disk, memory, and CPU to each database. Further, databases usually make assumptions about resources available to them. For example, Postgres has shared buffers, <clears throat> makes good use of the operating system cache, and comes with connection count settings, writes logs to the disk. If you're running 50 of these databases on a few physical machines, then resource pooling becomes tricky even with today's virtualization tech. If you have a distributed database that manages all the tenants, that you're using your database for what it's designed to do. You could shard, distribute your tables on tenant ID, and easily support 
tens of thousands of tenants. When all tenants share the same tables, a second related benefit involves operational simplicity. As your application grows, you will iterate on your database model and make improvements. For example, you may need to change the schema for one of your tables or add an index to improve query performance. If you're following an architecture where each tenant lives in a separate database or schema, then you need to implement an infrastructure that ensures that each schema change either succeeds across all the tenants or eventually gets rolled back. For example, what happens when you change the schema for 5,000 of 10,000 tenants and then one of your machines in your cluster failed? How do you handle that? When you shard your tables for multi-tenancy, now you're having your database do the work for you. The database will either ensure that an alter table goes through across all shards, or it will roll it back. Before I wrap up, I also wanted to touch upon a question that we hear frequently across all three design patterns. That question is, how does my largest tenant affect my scaling properties? We find that tenant data in multi-tenant databases usually follow a ZIF distribution. That is, you have a few popular tenants and then a long tail. You may have also heard of this distribution as power law, Pareto distribution, or the 80-20 rule. Actually, how many of you have heard of the 80-20 rule? So this is basically the same behavior plotted in a different way. Like, and then these are all rules or laws that mean the same thing, but then the axis and the uh, representations are just different. But the underlying fundamentals are the same. So this graph here displays a standard ZIF distribution, which is the 80-20 rule, more or less. And to construct this graph, you start with a representative sample of your database. You then take all tenants in that sample, say, let's say you did the dump, and count the number of rows where they occurred. You then sort those uh, tenants based on their number of occurrences. So rank one in here means the most popular tenant that you saw in your sample database, or this could be your ent uh, entire database. And what this graph says is the most popular tenant appeared in 10,000 rows in this sample. The second most popular one appeared in, let's say, 7,000 or 8,000 rows. And if you do the sorting this way, in this example, I think we have about 200,000 uh, tenants, if you will, and the least popular one only appeared once. And we plot this on a log-log graph. When we plot it, it actually gives us this uh, nice uh, curve in here. And the idea in here is your database could increase by 10x or 100x, so this graph would move up, uh, but the curvature of this uh, fit in here would remain the same. And practically, when you uh, we find that most multi-tenant databases, SaaS databases, follow a simp uh, similar graph. So, and basically with this, if you actually think of it, uh, this distribution this way, the nice thing in here is this is scale independent, so you can actually drive some understandings or ideas uh, out of this. So when you're looking to migrate your single machine database, the important question is, what percentage of the total data size does the largest tenant hold? In here, this would be this guy in here, like which is actually fairly almost 2x the second one, and then almost 2x the, uh, the second one is the, the third one. So what percentage of the total data size does the largest tenant hold? In this case, if your existing database serves 100 tenants and the largest tenant holds, say, 10% of the data, this approach that I mentioned will help you scale by 10x. If you assume a standard ZIF distribution, which is what the multi-tenant databases follow, we then come up with the following heuristics for the largest tenant. When you have 10 tenants, your largest tenant roughly holds about 60% of the data. When you have about 10,000 tenants, this means that your most popular tenant will have about 2% of the data, and you'll be able to scale to 50x or where you are today. Of course, these are general guidelines, and the best way to tell is by looking at your data. With that, I'll hand it over to Lucas to talk about the application side of the picture. And give me like two minutes to connect with you. So and maybe while Lucas is connecting, uh, I can't take any questions.
Great. Okay, and we can take further questions at the end, of course. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how to migrate your application to kind of a, like a distributed multi-tenant database, like Citus. Um, and these would apply, you know, to any typical distributed multi-tenant scenario. Um, so essentially, you know, the goal we kind of are after when we scale a multi-tenant database is, you know, we do something, we do something else, and then at some point we have scale, right? So we ideally, you know, can grow our compute and our storage and our RAM beyond a single node. And so kind of the first thing that, you know, you typically have to do is you have to add the tenant ID to all your tables. Um, that essentially means, so, you know, think of relational database, right? So the problem is a lot of your tables typically when they need to, like, find the team or the customer or, you know, the organization ID, they need to traverse multiple, like, levels, right? They need to go from, like, one object to another object to a third object in order to find out which tenant they belong to. And so one really important step to start with is essentially just add like ten ID into your table, uh, into every table, so that you can you know efficiently kind of group them together. Um, and you know, really simple if, example of this is you essentially you know have your kind of current setup, and then you know in this case line items, um, which we'll work with next, um, and you know have a primary key on line item ID here, and then the two changes we make is we you know kind of add the store ID, which is kind of the you know tenant in this example. Um, and then we also have to add the store ID into a primary key, right? So like kind of here we're saying, okay, from now on the line item ID is only unique inside the store, which is good enough for most examples. Um, the other thing you have to do in you know, most applications is you need to include the tenant ID in your queries, right? So the system needs to know which tenant are you actually looking for. And it, it's quite expensive typically to like, you know, look through all the data to find it. And so, you know, right now you might, might have something where like, you know, select star from products where ID is so-and-so. Um, and then in a system like Citus, what happens is, you know, application connects to, like, the coordinator node, which is your entry point. Um, and then, essentially, a coordinator node goes to all the distributed nodes that hold the data, and it tries to figure out, okay, where is this now, right? Like, where is this ID I'm looking for? And so, if you instead say, you know, ID and store ID, and then you also partition or shard on the store ID, what happens is the data for a single store lives on a single node, and so the coordinator, you know, can essentially a hash function, like look at, you know, the store ID and then says, oh, store ID 456, yeah, I know this is this one node. Um, or, you know, potentially, like whatever your setup is, right? But like the idea here is give it the information it needs to find, um, the node that it get, needs to get the data from, instead of it going to every node individually um, and getting the data. Um, the other thing here, and again, this is site specific, is um, for transactions, um, we kind of take advantage of the single node idea, right? So like on a single node for your tenant, um, for one tenant, um, you can do whatever you were doing on a single system, right? So like um, you can do select, update, insert, delete, inside a transaction works exactly the same way um, because we kind of, you know, locate all our data on that single node. And for DDL, this works across, of course. So. And then just to kind of before diving into a demo, um, if you're using Ruby on Rails, um, like lots of our you know, users and customers are using Rails. And so we built a thing called Active Record Multi-Tenant. Um, and I actually wrote that. Um, and so essentially it's a mechanism to like help you do these two steps, right? It's like help you add a tenant ID, help you include the tenant ID in all your queries so that you don't have to change your application, you don't have to rewrite SQL. Um, it's essentially done for you. Um, and really what you're doing then is you're kind of annotating your application. You're saying, okay, you know, this model belongs to this tenant, and then you, you tell your code, oh, you know, for this kind of section of my code, I'm working with this tenant. Um, and then the idea here is that you don't need to change any of the code that's in between. Um, you just need to tell your system what tenant you're working with. And so really, um, we've seen that, you know, being much better than, you know, having to change, like having to rewrite queries. Um, and based on that, you can run a system like Citus um, in the background, right? Um, in the front end, it's still your Rails app um, without any modifications, really. And I'd be happy to dive more into this. Like, if one of you runs a Rails app, I'm happy to talk in detail. Um, that said, um, we'll jump to a quick demo. Um, again, this is of Citus, but it would apply to other multi-tenant databases, too. Um, and I'm essentially going to show, you know, how does this work, like, on a distributed system, uh, the difference between, like, a single shard, multi-shard queries, um, just kind of, you know, give you a glimpse of, of how this can work. All right, so, um, so for this example, let's see if this works. Great. All right, so for this example, I will use Citus Cloud. Um, that's essentially the team I'm on uh, at Citus. We do a distributed database as a service um, on top of AWS. Um, so this is running in the cloud. 
the Wi-Fi is stable, um, so I should be able to do it. Um, and here you can just say we essentially provisioned what we call a formation. Um, and a formation, most importantly, has a URL, so I can you know kind of click. Let's see, I'm not mirroring, so this might be complicated. Let's see. All right. Um, so you can see here, um, you know, it's essentially just a Postgres connection string. I actually do one quick thing because I have to type things next, so I will enable mirroring here. All right, better. And then, da -da. all right, perfect. Um, so uh, anyhow, so you have uh, the connection string here. Um, this here, in this case, has two nodes, like two di two data nodes and one coordinator. And so essentially what we'll do is we'll connect to, you know, kind of the coordinator node through this connection string. Um, and we'll load some data and we'll, you know, essentially take a look at how this works. So I have terminal here. I'll make it a bit bigger. I hope this is visible. Oh, well, maybe I'll pull it a bit more. One second. All right. Cool. So, a bit small because the screen is small, but I think you should be able to see it. So here I'm on an EC2 instance um, that's in the same region. So I'm kind of you know trying to account for any network um, latency here, um, and I'm essentially just loading some CSV. Um, before or in order to start that, I'm essentially taking this connection string. I'll go using psql, um, you know, standard Postgres client. Um, we can check here, there's no data here. Um, we can also check here, like no distributed tables. So, the, you know, it's essentially an empty system. And so, what we'll do next is we'll essentially, um, and this is also something I'd be happy to share with you later. It's essentially a tutorial that we've done in the past. Um, and I'm essentially using that tutorial as a, you know, quick demo how to see how the system works. Um, and so, in order to start, um, we'll just define a couple of tables. Um, I think this was a 10 minute mark, so I'll speed it up a bit. Um, so, essentially, we'll, um, create a user's table. Um, and important here is Citus has two different concepts of tables. There's a reference table, which is data that's the same on every node. And there's distributed tables, which is different on every node, right? So a reference table is something that you typically want to join against, and you don't want to join against in a single tenant. You want to join against like, as part of all your data, essentially. And so in this case, users um, is a reference table because a user could belong or could have multiple stores. And so, you know, I'm just going to paste these here. Um, we have stores, which belong to a user. Then we have products. Um, and one interesting detail here is uh, you can see we have foreign keys, right? So, like, we're not just, you know, doing NoSQL. Um, we're actually doing, you know, fully relational um, foreign key, like, referential type of data. And then, so a store has products. Um, products have orders. And then orders have line items. And you can see this gets quite complicated. Here we have like three different foreign keys um, across all these tables. All right, and then um, I'll load some data. Um, for this, I like it's not big data, <laughs> um, small data, um, but it's sufficient to you know be loaded quickly and show you what's going on. Um, this is going to take a bit longer. Um, so essentially, it's like a million orders or so. Um, but essentially, um, we're using this, you know, as a quick example. This has multiple like stores, so different tenants, right? So data is distributed across these two nodes. Um, then, essentially, in this point, we're constrained by two things: um, the local I/O, and then also the the fact that we have these foreign key constraints, right? So foreign key constraints take time to check. Um, so essentially, as it's inserting every one of these rows, it's making sure it's actually referential, um, like it has integrity. Um, so before, when I was testing it, it actually gave me an error here because I had a line item that didn't belong to an order that exists. Um, so you know, helpful to have. <laughs> and so once that's done, we can switch to essentially running a couple of queries. And so essentially, what we're doing here is and this might be a bit small again. Um, so we're just doing some simple SQL. Um, the nice thing here is you don't have to change what you're doing, essentially, right? Um, the system kind of will figure out for you what to do. So the first thing is we'll do a count on stores. Stores is fairly small. Um, we'll also do an explain on it. Um, explain, I assume you're familiar with it, just shows you the query plan. Um, in this case, it shows you a distributed query plan. So it shows you it's actually going to 32 shards, which is the default we have here. 
and it's doing a sequential scan on all of these. Um, it makes sense that this is a sequential scan because, you know, small data here. Um, but this could very well be an index scanner or, you know, more complicated things. Um, here is a query that um, essentially from, like, in the products table looks for a specific tenant. Um, so this is a good example of, you know, if you have a multi-tenant application, most of your queries are going to look like this where they're always related to a single tenant customer team. And so, you know, we can run it. It returns. Um, we can do an explain analyze on it. Um, and, you know, in this case, we can see it's using an index on the worker. Um, and more importantly, it's going to a single machine. Right? It's like the system can be really efficient at figuring out where to go. And then we can do the same thing with a reference table, um, just to show you here. Um, so on the, in the reference cable, table case, oh, sorry, I'm joining here. Okay, so I'm joining against something. So I'm, I'm looking at something from stores. Um, so you can see here we're doing a sequential scan on stores, and then we're also doing a sequential scan on users, the reference table, to essentially get a count in this case. Um, all right, um, we can also do inserts, you know, because there's kind of standard SQL. Um, so really the point here is, you know, this just supports SQL. Um, you can do an update. Um, I can explain the update, obviously. Um, so, you know, that's just really standard stuff. Um, interesting things here, and this is, maybe I'll make it a bit smaller. Um, so the interesting thing here is we actually have transactions, right? So it's, it's actually full MVCC. Um, so we, what we can do is we can do a count. Um, and then, so we, you know, we looked for certain line items, essentially. We make a transaction, right, begin. Um, we now do something you shouldn't do in your production system, which is we delete the data by accident, right? Um, so at this point, the data, as far as we know, in this transaction, it's gone, right? So this is the exact same query. Um, the data is not visible anymore. And then if we had another session, the other session would still see the data. Um, and if we now roll back and we run the same query again, data is still there, right? Um, and I think that's what's really interesting here is you don't, you know, you actually have the full transactional um, relational capability. All right, um, I can run a couple more queries here. Um, really the point here is, you know, you can do joins, you can do complicated things. Let me show you something interesting. So we support something called the shard rebalancer, which is essentially a mechanism, and actually I need to do something for that, um, which is essentially a mechanism to um, move your data around, right? Five minutes. Um, <laughs> so um, essentially the, the interesting story here is because we want to scale out, right? We want to be able to essentially you know, we could change our instance sizes, but then what we really want is to have more nodes, right? So right now we have two nodes. Actually, the other one is scaling up, it's three nodes, and I'm scaling it up to four nodes, right? And so then what we want to do is to essentially move our shards around so that, you know, before it was like 32 shards across two machines, which is 16 each. Um, if it's on four nodes, it's gonna be eight each. Um, and so we wanna be able to do that whilst remaining online, right? So we don't wanna do a dump and restore. Um, we actually wanna redistribute our data. And so one thing I did here, um, and this is, you know, like essentially the same system I just was using it before. Um, so on Citus Cloud, you can essentially just scale up your formation. Um, and, you know, this is literally just launching a new EC2 instance. Um, and so here, you know, going from four to five, like we can essentially just choose. Um, price is a, you know, component here, of course. Um, and so essentially what the system is doing now, you can see it's scaling up, like it's bringing up that node. And let me connect to the right machine here. And so we can run a query. Right, so on this machine you can see right now I had three nodes on this machine before, or this formation before. Um, and so essentially what I'm doing is I'm, um, I'm gonna be moving that data around so it's split on four machines. And I can do that as soon as the node is up which should be the case shortly. Might actually take a moment. Um, but yeah, essentially what I'll do, like as soon as it's up, is I'll essentially do a rebalance of the data. Um, and the interesting thing here is it kind of, it keeps the data together, right? So the, the idea is you move one tenant kind of to another system. Um, and then one other thing which I'll not demo today because of time constraints is um, there's also functionality to essentially isolate the tenant. Um, so Osgum was kind of describing, you know, how you like have a table that shares the data, uh, like, you know, multiple tenants per table. And so sometimes you have customers that kind of require, you know, their data to be dedicated, right? So Amazon has dedicated instances. Um, this is kind of a similar thing where you can isolate a specific tenant in your shared tables. Um, and then you can move that specific tenant to their own machine, essentially, right? 
Um, the interesting thing here is that the entry point to the system stays the same. So your, like your application can still issue a query, um, and the query you know, just contains the correct customer ID, and that customer lives on their own machine, um, but for your application, there is no change needed. And so that's really, really useful as you have customers that have you know, these kind of requirements where they really need their own instance, um, and you can handle them as a one-off as opposed to everybody having their own instance. Right, let me see if this... Yeah, <laughs> I, I, the problem is I was testing it before, and then I didn't leave the instance empty, which was my own mistake. Um, but anyhow, yeah, I think that's essentially concluding the demo here, uh, and I'd be happy to show you in person later how it's moving the data around. Um, is there, let me go back to the presentation. All right, um, so just in summary, and this kind of you know summarizes both Oscan's um, and kind of my portion. Um, so the idea here really is you could you know, either vertically or horizontally scale your database. Um, typically it's a question of time, right? So like it's initially often you just you know, scale up and that's fine, um, but at some point you hit the limit of a single node. Um, at that point you need to figure out how do I scale out, right? Um, with Postgres historically it's been a difficult thing um, and we you know, kind of fill that niche. Um, where especially for a multi-tenant uh, B2B database, um, it's really about picking kind of the right distribution column um, collocating tables, right? And then using this idea of having one tenant lives on one node, so your application can still use the full Postgres features um, and doesn't need to like change and like re-architect everything. Um, and there is kind of three different design patterns that we touched on. Um, the kind of shared table model that I just quickly demoed also is the best in terms of performance um, and scaling out um, with some constraints around isolation that you need to work around on. Um, and that's essentially it. Um, this works, just as a you know, quick note, um, CIDAS typically works best you know, terabyte plus you know, upwards. Um, so we see customers you know, using us with multiple hundred terabytes of data, um, and it still works, right? So like it's, it's really a nice system if you hit this limit of like, you know, single node Postgres typically tops out at, I'd say, five terabytes or so. Um, and that's really where this you know, becomes key to scaling up. Um, anyhow, um, that's that. Um, a quick note here, so um, I was tasked to give people socks, um, so uh, this depending on the size, but I'll just make a quick note here, so Craig from our team uh, had this nice, nice tweet about, as a kid he hated getting socks as a gift, but as an adult, socks are great. Um, so we have side of socks. Um, I'm actually, since you know, we have uh, about one minute left, excellent. Um, so since we have you know, uh, a couple of people here, um, essentially any questions that gets asked gets a sock if you want, or two, two socks. Um, and then uh, if you sign up for Citus Cloud, uh, you can either have another pair of socks um, or you know, just uh, get your first pair. Um, so essentially just sign up to Citus Data, um, Citus Cloud. Um, there's a created account thing, um, email address, password, and then I'll reach out to you and I'll send you a free pair of socks uh, your way. They're actually quite nice. Um, they have a distributed database on them. Um, but yeah, um, that is it. Any questions? Um, I can't really disclose that. Um, being an engineer also, <laughs> so I'm the wrong person to ask. Um, but you know, it's been in production for a while. The company's been around uh, for five years now, six years. Um, although we only recently launched a cloud offering. So a cloud offering is about a year old. Um, other questions? Um, so everything, let me just see if the shard rebalancer is now demoable. Um, give me one quick second. So the, the rebalancer where you like redistribute the data, um, the underlying functions like that we built it on top are open source, um, but that said, um, I can actually show you now. So we have you know, an empty node here, and so we are essentially, um, we can run a function that, let's see where is it, there. Yeah, exactly. That, that's what I was about to say. So this function here is not open source. Um, everything else is. Um, so essentially, you know, we we try to work closely with the Postgres community. We have some Postgres core contributors uh, in the company as well. Um, the idea really is that you know the core Citus functionality is open source. Um, this one here integrates deeply into like what you know Citus Cloud does essentially in terms of scaling up and in terms of you know handling failover whilst this is going on. Um, so there is this is about the only component that isn't open source. Um, you mean Citus or the shard rebalancer? Uh, it's actually an extension, so I believe if you do a DX now, let me see, yeah, there's a shard rebalancer. 
So it's like a special extension. So it's it's literally like here we have, I mean, there's a few other details to like one other feature that is actually not in the open source is like uh, co like some complex like permission things. So like if you do role level security or so on, um, there's some additional things we support in there. Um, but essentially, this is basically the open source site is here, and then you have to shard rebalancer as a separate extension. Um, so. And there's also session analytics, which is another extension. Um. <laughs> Anyhow, more questions? Well, I don't know. Let's try it. <laughs> Let me, do you want to hunt about it? Yeah. <laughs> and we, we've been having a lot of discussions internally in terms of how to you know, design these talks and so on. Um, anyhow, uh, thank you for coming by. Um, happy to you know, answer any more questions on CITES or Postgres or multi-tenancy um, after the talk. So thanks. <laughs>